We are here now at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, where the pharmacists of tomorrow are made. My name is Fadi. My name is Yusuf. And my name is Hamid. And we are all PharmD students at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy in Toronto, Canada. During the past couple of months, the pandemic has significantly changed the course of everyone's lives. And I'm sure many of you have questions and concerns about COVID-19. We are here to tell you today that you do not have to look too far for answers. Pharmacists are an essential part of our healthcare systems found in the community and even in hospitals. They are the most accessible healthcare providers on the front lines, specializing in medication therapy and management to ensure you have access to medications that work best for you. Personally, through our experiences, we've learned what pharmacists do in their day-to-day -day lives. And since the pandemic has had a global impact, we started thinking about pharmacists around the world and how they are helping their patients during these unprecedented times. Through a series of episodes, you'll be hearing from pharmacists from around the world. This series will highlight topics pertaining to COVID-19 from local and global pharmacy perspectives. We are looking to raise awareness of a pharmacist scope of practice in Canada and around the world during the COVID-19 pandemic. Before we hear from the pharmacists, we would like to present some basic information about COVID-19. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. It has almost been 200 days since the first outbreaks of viral pneumonia in Wuhan, China were determined to be caused by a novel coronavirus. This coronavirus was later named Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2, or SARS-CoV-2. Studies have shown significant similarities between SARS-CoV-2 and two other coronaviruses present in bats. Scientists are still unsure whether there may have been an intermediate host such as a pangolin. The World Health Organization created a timeline of the events from discovery to present day. Some key events are as follows. January 13th, Thailand reported a case making it the first confirmed case outside of the People's Republic of China. On January 21st, the first confirmed case in North America was reported in the United States. And by January 24th, France confirmed a case making it the first case in Europe and it continued to spread with the United Arab Emirates reporting a case on January 29th, making it the first confirmed case in the Middle East. By February 14th, the first reported case in Africa was found in Egypt, and by March 7th, there were 100,000 cases worldwide. One thing to remember is these are all confirmed cases that were declared to the WHO. There may have been earlier cases that were just not identified yet. Officially, on March 11th, the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. It officially reached 1 million cases worldwide on April 14th. And as of the time of filming this video, the total number of cases has reached 14 million, and it has caused over 600,000 deaths worldwide. By the numbers, we can see how effective it is at spreading, and researchers have found the reproduction number, or the r naught, to be about 3. This represents how well a disease can spread, or in other words, the average number of people one infected person can transmit the virus to. So in this case, one person entering into a population with no vaccine or proper precautions in place may infect on average three people. And as you can imagine, each of those three people may infect another three people, and so on. This is why it is very important to always get vaccinated. But since there is no vaccine in this case yet, we have to consider and adhere to other safety practices to help limit the spread. COVID-19 is a respiratory virus that is transmitted through an infected individual. This can be done through respiratory droplets generated when you cough or sneeze. Now, this doesn't mean you're safe if you only stay away from coughs and sneezes. 
COVID-19 can be spread through close, prolonged personal contact, such as shaking hands. Keeping this in mind, we need to continue to practice social distancing. It is always important to wear personal protective equipment and wash your hands whenever you have the chance, because touching something with the virus and then touching your mouth, nose, or eyes can transmit the virus. Also, someone who is infected can spread the virus without showing any symptoms. So again, practice social distancing, wash your hands, and wear masks because current evidence suggests person-to-person -person spread is efficient when there is close contact. So here we can see the structure of the COVID-19 particle and inside this capsid we have genetic material which is single-stranded RNA and as we can see on the outside we have these spike proteins and interestingly if you look under a microscope these spike proteins they do look like a crown and hence that's where the name coronavirus came from because corona in Latin means crown and these spike proteins are very important for determining something called a host tropism and what I mean by host tropism is that this virus is only able to infect certain types of cells and certain range of hosts, in our case being humans. So for example, if someone coughs or sneezes, these droplets containing the virus particle, they can enter through your nose or mouth and they can travel all the way down inside of your lungs. Now inside of your lungs there are these sac-like structures called alveoli and inside the alveoli there are two types of cells. The first one is a type 1 alveolar cell which is responsible for the process of gas exchange and the second one is a type 2 alveolar cell which is responsible for producing surfactant which is something that's really essential for the process of breathing. Now according to research, once the virus enters this alveoli, it will attach to a receptor on the type 2 alveolar cell known as the ACE2 receptor. Here we can see the ACE2 receptor on the type 2 alveolar cell and at this point the virus will enter through spike protein attachment. Once the virus enters, the capsid will dissolve releasing its genetic material into the cell. Moving on, when the viral RNA enters, it begins to replicate itself. I should point out it will use the host machinery because the virus cannot carry out this process on its own. At this stage, the virus will make proteins and other components required to make more viral particles. These extra copies will then be released outside the cell to go and infect more cells. Now that I've talked about how COVID-19 enters the body and infects these alveolar cells, it's important to understand the body's response to this infection. The body would release inflammatory molecules to notify other cells of this infection. First, macrophages inside the alveoli release molecules that travel to the blood vessels surrounding these alveoli, making them more permeable. As a result, the fluid inside the blood vessel leaks out, causing the alveoli to collapse. Furthermore, surfactant production has also reduced significantly, leading to dyspnea or in other words, difficulty breathing. This infection also interrupts gas exchange, preventing type 1 alveolar cells from functioning. This leads to symptoms such as low oxygen, or in other words, hypoxemia. These effects together also manifest into a cough that many patients may experience. Furthermore, some inflammatory molecules can reach a part of your brain called the hypothalamus, signaling the release of molecules that increase your body's temperature. This is the body's response to removing foreign pathogens, leading to a fever. Some cases may result in more severe pathophysiological conditions, leading to systemic effects, multi-organ failure, and eventually death. The following information is for general knowledge, for an initial assessment of your symptoms. Please consult a healthcare provider if you suspect you have COVID-19. It is also advised that all patients with symptoms or questions about testing to contact a local public health unit for up-to-date recommendations regarding next steps. Pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare professionals in our community, so if you ever have questions about COVID-19, you can always call your local pharmacy who have access to up-to-date clinical information. I should point out that the clinical presentation of COVID-19 varies. Some people are asymptomatic carriers, while others with moderate illness present with the following common symptoms. A fever greater than 37.8 degrees Celsius, chills, a cough, shortness of breath, headache, and sore throat. Symptoms that require immediate medical attention include difficulty breathing, chest pain, drowsiness, a new onset of confusion, and discoloration of the face and lips. What factors put you at risk for COVID-19? Older adults and individuals with underlying health conditions may be at greater risk of developing severe illness. 
Some conditions include heart disease, diabetes, and a compromised immune system. But wait, this does not mean young people can't get COVID-19. There have been several cases of infections in younger people. All age groups should take the necessary precautions to stop the spread of COVID-19. My name is Christina Adams. I'm the Chief Pharmacy Officer for the Canadian Society of Hospital Pharmacists. So I'm a Canadian pharmacist with hospital training by background. Well, I practice um, in the United States, um, just outside of Seattle. Um, I own and operate two independent pharmacies um, in the area. Um, I've been doing that since uh, 93, so 27 years now. Um, I, I've had the one store for 27 years. The second store um, I purchased back at the end of September of last year. So um, in light of all of the changes, not an ideal time to take on a second staff in a, a second location, but um, you know, it is what it is, hindsight, right? 2020, that's our favorite saying these days, right? Um, so yeah, I, um, I, I run the two. I'm pharmacist in charge at both stores. Um, I oversee the day-to-day -day operations at both. I don't spend a lot of time on the front line as pharmacist um, filling, um, but I, I manage all of the clinical side of things and you know, making sure all the regulatory is in place. My name is Israel, Israel I'm assistant Israel I practice currently in Nigeria. Um, I graduated from pharmacy school in 2016. I currently practice in a community pharmacy, like a, like a retail outlet, where we um, get to see patients around the community because most times the first point of call for many people who seek medical help is community pharmacy before we now, okay, we attend to them or refer them to hospitals if need be or attend to the urgent medical needs. So basically, I work in a community setting where I attend to people around my community then basic medical needs they require and then make sure their medications are always available at every point in time. So my name is Johar. I practice in Ontario, Canada. I'm a community pharmacist and I own a few independent pharmacies. So I practice in those pharmacies, but I also am heavily involved on the medical side. So I run, I run medical clinics as well. So I kind of work on both sides of pharmacy and medical. Mi nombre es Guido Silva, eh, soy de Ecuador. En Ecuador eh, yo practico, bueno, hago mi, mi vida laboral acá. Estuve un tiempo, eh, hace dos semanas acabo de retornar. Estuve un tiempo en Europa haciendo mi posgrado. Soy químico y farmacéutico, graduado de la Universidad de Guayaquil desde el 2014. Y actualmente tengo un máster en Biología Molecular, Celular y genética. Además, soy investigador en tuberculosis y fui certificado por la OMS en el 2019. He trabajado en hospitales, he trabajado en, por parte del Ministerio de Salud Pública, he trabajado en los institutos de seguridad social de mi país, pero creo que la parte más importante que cumplo ahora es ser el representante de, de esta asociación gremial nacional une a, a todos los farmacéuticos de mi país. En sí fue formada para poder respaldarnos, para poder ayudarnos y sobre todo darnos la mano para poder potenciar esta carrera que en mi país es muy olvidada. Es una carrera que es muy pisoteada en Ecuador, es una carrera que generalmente no tiene agradecimiento acá, ganamos, los farmacéuticos ganamos muy poco y constantemente estamos en una gran batalla 
para que nuestro, nuestro gremio o nuestra carrera profesional sea aceptada. and I am a professor of clinical pharmacy at the University of California, Skagg School of Pharmacy and Pharmaceutical Sciences. I am a clinical pharmacist in my area of expertise and practice is chronic kidney disease. So I practice ambulatory care um, two days a week and then uh, three days a week I have a research program which is focused on the pharmacogenomics of drug-induced kidney injury. And then um, I chair courses uh, for the School of Pharmacy. So I chaired therapeutics for about 10 years. And now I've um, started a new course series called Advanced Professional Practice, where we are hoping to train our students to be able to fill the role of an advanced provider. Um, because there is legislature in California um, and a whole license category on advanced providers. I'm, my name is Sean Simpson. I'm a community pharmacist and, and pharmacy owner in Niagara-on-the-Lake, Ontario. Um, I also uh, sit on the Canadian Pharmacists Association board as the uh, Ontario Pharmacists Association representative. So I've been in, involved in pharmacy advocacy for, for a number of years now, and I see a great deal of potential and the role pharmacists can play in helping people uh, manage their health and, and their healthcare conditions. My name is Hongyi. Hong Yi Chen, my surname is Chen. Okay, uh, I'm a critical care pharmacist, uh, currently practicing in uh, Singapore General Hospital. So my day-to-day -day, um, role would be, uh, in the morning, I will be joining the medical ICU ward rounds. You know, the, so this is the daily rounds. Mm -hmm. And on certain days, I'll be covering the burns unit as well because there are a couple of us, so I will, not be a, I will not be covering burns unit every day. But my main practice area would be medical ICU and the burns uh, unit. Yeah. yeah, I'm a pharmacist. Uh, I started working 15 years ago, about 15 years ago. I live in, um, let's say, in, near Bologna. Uh, it's in the north of Italy, next uh, near near to Milan. Milan, let's say, not so near, but maybe most uh, people know where Milan is. And uh, as I was saying, I'm I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a compounding pharmacist. I'm not a counter pharmacist. I spend my working life in. Uh, in a laboratory, making drugs, compounding. Uh, okay. uh, my name's uh, Glenn Cooper. I'm a pharmacist in England, in the UK, um, and I am a lead surgical pharmacist in my hospital, which is in, based in Bristol. Um, and that role is split with the University of Bath where I do um, undergraduate teaching at the hospital. 